my story is about a collaboration that happened here in, Med or in uh, Medicine Hat here. Not here, there, sorry. <laughs> um, the collaboration was formed between uh, the city of Medicine Hat, the Grassland Naturalists, uh, Medicine Hat College, and Calfrack Well Services. So in uh, Medicine Hat, there's a piece of property that's a habitat for plant on the endangered species list, tiny, crypta uh, tiny cryptantha. Tiny cryptantha is a small plant that only grows about 12 centi er, 20 centimeters, and it only grows along four areas along the South Saskatchewan River. Unfortunately, this piece of property er, was being overrun by baby's breath. Baby's breath is a, white, a tiny white flower that you find in your floral arrangements, most commonly associated with the roses. Uh, florists love using it as a filler flower. Baby's red produces 10,000 seeds per plant, and it ends up uh, turning into a uh, tumbleweed in the winter time, where it spreads across a, or rolls across the prairie, spreading its seed everywhere. It'll have a taproot that'll go four meters down. Ooh. Four meters down and spread its, itself across the prairies there. In the 1800s, uh, settlers brought it over as an ornamental for the, their arrangements, for their flowers. On this piece of particular property, um, it was in, we couldn't use normal herbicide methods because of the rare plants. If you use herbicide or mowing, you end up killing off the rare plants. So the city was kind of stuck on what they could do. When a former alderman had talked about visiting the property, he uh, described some of the plants as being as big as a Volkswagen. And I used to laugh at him thinking he was just exaggerating. That is until I found that monster there. It's, it was. It could very well be uh, as big as a Volkswagen. Like I said, the city wasn't, the city wasn't sure how to handle this problem. Uh, you couldn't use herbicide or whatnot. And I learned about this during the workshop where I thought to myself, you know, I know a whole lot of people that, are, that aren't doing a whole lot of anything during the spring breakup. They, they're looking for something to do. Um, as we said, I spent about 12 years in the oil field. And during springtime, you, all the guys are pulled out of the field and they're stuck in the shop, just itching to get back out in the field, waiting for the weather to turn better so that they can get back out there. So I ended up talking to a few people and whatnot, and then I headed off to the city of Madison Hat, and I told the city of Madison Hat about my idea. And basically, I wanted to just hand the project over to them and say, hey, here's an idea, you guys should do this, right? And uh, the city said, you know what? That's an awesome idea, Sean. You're a project manager. I'm in the middle of school. I don't have time for something like this. No, that's not going to happen. And his response was pretty much the same thing. We don't have time. We don't have the manpower. So there he was, project manager. OK. So my next step was to head on, on up to Calcraft Well Services. I walked, or before I walked in there, I had this big speech prepared, list of reasons why Calfrac wanted to get involved with a project like this. Uh, corporate social responsibility, um, it would be an opportunity to keep the people busy during the slow time, uh, the positive public story, and, um, but anyways, I had this big list there, and I walked in and I talked to Dave, the, the manager of the base there, and I told him my idea, and he says, you know what, that sounds great, let's do it, Sean. No, you can't say yes yet. I haven't told you why you want to do this. I've got a speech prepared. But he didn't want to listen. He was already sold, so we were set to do it. I was told that uh, this was a thick fibrous wood root. So I had pictured all of my guys out there with axes trying to chop these plants out. I was just picturing a nightmare. So over the winter time, I spent uh, my winter trying to research different means to get this plant out of there. We were looking at uh, postal augers where we would, you know, kind of drill the whole, drill the roots out. Um, I had a guy that was ready to donate an excavator, a mini excavator. We'd dig in and cut the plant out. Um, we were looking at fitting a blade on top of a bobcat that would slide in, cut them out, and of course the hand digging method there. So um, spring came along, and it's me and some grassland naturalists. We went down to Police Point to finally try out what hand digging would be like. And uh, I got up there and I, I used my shovel and whatnot, and the roots came up fairly easy. And I kind of felt like the roots were sort of the texture of a carrot. So it was pretty easy to do, and we decided that was going to be the method we were going to do. Uh, 
So I felt pretty empowered by that knowledge and uh, right after that I organized all the big leaks to come on out to the ranch land property where we're going to test out and see what we're getting into. So I took my own personal shovel and went out and found a fairly large root and I went to start digging this plant out and I wrecked my shovel. So off I went and I got another shovel and uh, I came back and, and the manager of Calcraft, he takes the shovel from me. Here Sean, let me show you how this is done. <laughs> All right, <laughs> so he digs it out and there's no problems. And I bend it over to, to pull the plant out of the, prop, or out of the hole, right in front of the only female on location, right in front of Jim McDonald, and I split my jeans wide open. <laughs> I can't say I honestly felt like project material at that point, or project management material. So, but you know, the crazy thing was, I took this root and I threw it in the back of my truck and my truck had a cover on it, so there was no light, there was no water. Um, I think it was still freezing at night. The basically growing conditions just sucked. Half the, or most of it was, was cut off. And I threw it in the back of my truck, and a couple of days later there was an orientation for, for the people of Calfrack. We're going to explain to them what's going on or whatever, right? And uh, I pulled out this root to show them what it looks like. And this root had brand new sprouts on it. Sprouts that weren't there when we dug up, and you can see all the sprouts growing on this plant. What? This plant should be dead. How is it growing now? So we were told that there was about five to 8,000 plants on the property. And Calfrack Well Services, they donated about 150 guys in 2014, and this equaled about 1,200 man hours. We dug out 30,000 plants by hand shoveling. We dug 12 inches below the crown and severed the root off. And uh, these roots were taken to the landfill where they're buried about four feet below ground. And in these anaerobic conditions, they're going to end up decomposing. The largest plant that we found had a 41 centimeter circumference. The grasslands naturalists, they volunteered to come on out and identify the plants that needed to be removed. So they set up flags for the Calfrack people to, to be able to find the plants and dig them up. The city of Medicine had provided lunches and waters for the people. And at the very end of the, the whole project there, uh, the city provided a barbecue and gifts for the, all the hardworking people who made this project happen. You can see here, each flag was in a plant that needed to be removed. Along the roadside, the density was a lot more thicker because, of course, this is open, open source of the service where plants can, weeds can easily establish. In 2014, uh, we decided to do the project again, so this was our second year. Caltrack donated another 120 got 20 people for another 800 man hours. We removed another 22,000 plants from the property. We found that this was very successful in finding out the results of the first year's uh, efforts. I really believe that any of the plants that we removed in the first year did not grow back. And that was kind of a concern of ours is if we were actually doing anything or if everything that we dug up was just going to regrow. Um, when we were out there, any plants that had any kinds of signs of disturbance around them, we were looking, obviously, we were monitoring for signs of disturbance. And any plants that looked like they had some digging, we dug even deeper just to check and see what the roots looked like, see if they had any kind of odd shapes to them that would indicate that they had started growing again. We didn't find any plants with any odd shapes or uh, anything like that. So like I said, I honestly believe that all the plants that we removed were either plants that we had missed the first year or new seedlings that had started growing again in the second, semester, or in the second year. This project ended up being a huge, huge success. Uh, all the local media channels ran stories. There was a million different stories there. But it, it grew even bigger than that. CBC and CBTV ended up picking up the story. And uh, the Canadian press ended up doing an interview with me. And when the Canadian press read the story, it ends up going all across Canada. This showed up in Vancouver, Winnipeg, uh, Brandon, Manitoba, Calgary, Lethbridge, the Huffington Post. There was so much stuff, I couldn't keep track of everything. It was just insane. Uh, I was invited to go on to the Canadian Land Reclamation uh, Association's National Meeting out in Quebec. And when I traveled out there, I was only out there for about five minutes talking to somebody who had already heard about the project long before I ever got to Quebec. It was the news of this project had spread like wildfire. This project was nominated for an Alberta Animal Award, and in fact, we were finalists for the award. 
And right now, I'm currently being nominated for a Civic Award. So the question is, why was this project so successful? I strongly believe it has a lot to do with the collaboration that I formed. In the beginning there, we were a little bit concerned, well, what happens if this turns bad, or it turns negative? The oil field is always getting negative stories uh, published about them, and that was a big concern, is we didn't want this to turn into another bad story for the oil field. So I thought about it, and I was wondering, well, who could turn this into something negative? And I thought, to me, the most likely source would be the grassland naturalists. They're very concerned about the ranch land's property, and they're very concerned about uh, the tiny Kukatha and the well-being of the tiny Kukatha. So the next thing I did was I went down to the grasslands naturalists, and I talked to them about it. I got them involved in the project, and they were very enthusiastic to be a part of this project. So the other part of, of why I think this was so successful is throughout all stages of, of the project, I kept looking at it, every group that was involved and asking myself, what's in it for them? Why are they doing this? And when I looked at CalFrac, I didn't just look at them as CalFrac as well services. I looked at them as, as three different in, individual organizations. I looked at them as corporate CalFrac, uh, CalFrac Medicine Hat, and then also the field staff. And I asked them, what's in it for each one of those? And I tried to make sure that, that they were, were pretty happy with what was going on. This project has had a tremendous impact on the community. Most everybody in Medicine Hat now knows about the problems that baby's breath is causing in, in the city and in the environment. Last year I wanted to collect some seeds for a demonstration so I, so I could show people what a thousand seeds look like. At the time the plants should be going to seeds, I couldn't find any plants. The whole community has gotten on board with getting rid of baby's breath from the city. Calfrac is now aware of how invasive species spread and they are very best very invested in the well-being of the ranch land's property. Calfrac, every time I, I see Calfrac personnel, they're asking me and they want to know that they've made a difference in the property. They're asking what's going on with the property, have they, how is the weed population and whatnot in that part. So this has been an opportunity for Calfrac to keep their guys productive during a slow time and to give back to the community. And this is something that Calfrac has been very proud of. Last year I was involved in some weed management. I found that it seems that over the last couple of years there's been a growing interest in controlling baby spread. I believe that has a lot to do with the awareness that I've, I've created with this project. The problems with, uh, that, that are being caused by baby breath isn't just restricted to baby spread. It's all invasive weeds. Any ornamental that has that's in people's gardens has the potential of becoming an invasive species. We're asking that uh, whenever anybody sees some a non-native plant that's out in the wild that it should be destroyed. Uh, invasive species are causing huge amounts of economical and environmental damage. Calfrac Well Services in the city have become industrial leaders showing the initiative to become environmental stewards. It's my hope that you see in the future every company that uh, has a spring slowdown, that's affected by a spring slowdown, gets involved in some sort of environmental issue during their slow time. I've been talking with other groups looking at getting some other projects going. We've been looking at doing some antelope fencing, uh, protecting the spawning grounds of two different trout on the endangered species list, doing some pre uh, beaver tree wrapping, targeting and targeting other invasive species. In Medicine there's a natural uh, park called Police Point, and it's having some issues with buckthorn. Buckthorn, or, yeah, buckthorn replaces choke cherries. Choke cherries is made of feed for the wildlife, whereas buckthorn berries are very toxic. I've been working on an environmental awareness course where I'd like to teach people that are out in the field the issues that are happening in the environment and how they can reduce their environmental impact. I'm, I'm a, doing some research into crowd, uh, crowdsourcing and crowdfunding. And again, this is where I like to put a little plug in for myself. So if there's anybody out there that's looking for a highly motivated individual to join your team, <laughs> I'm your guy. Come talk to me a little bit later. Please, I'm begging you. Calfrac um, has created, or Calfrac and the City of Medicine have created a paradigm shift, where industry is starting to become environmental stewards, protecting the land 
and fighting this battle. We've been fighting this battle with a hands-on approach and by creating public awareness. This project has been called a partnership of unlikely partners. It's been an amazing effort on a national level. This project has inspired several people to join our fight. And I'm asking the question now to you all. Are you ready to join the fight? And this kind of seems like a redundant question, given where I'm at, but what can you do? If there's anybody else, or if anybody's interested in learning a little bit more about the Baby Spread Project or my future adventures, you can look me up on Facebook on my page, Something Good for Nature, and uh, I plan in the future to have some more information about crowdsourcing or crowdfunding.